and I wasn't writing anything publishable either, but, <laughs> but I didn't know how to, where did you get, uh, find out about agents and publishers? Did you have some source of information? Yeah, it was really a long learning process. I, I'm pretty much just started online looking up blogs, mm-hmm. articles, things that people were uh, publishing about writing, getting on social media and connecting with other writers. I found some critique partners online and started working with them and they gave me a lot of advice about writing craft and really mm-hmm. helped me uh, to strengthen my first book. So it was really just going out and pursuing the information about craft that I needed, the information about publishing that I needed, finding a lot of resources. Was there a particular source that was really useful to you? There's a blog called Fiction University. It's Mm -hmm. written by author Janice Hardy. I really found a lot of useful information there. Publishing Crawl is a young adult focused blog that's really helpful if you're interested in uh, publishing for young adults. Yeah, th- those were the big ones that I think I started with. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but your books, is it proper to classify them as fantasy? Yes. Why did you go that direction? Fantasy has always been, a, been my favorite genre. When I was a young reader, first reading books independently, fantasy was always the genre that I was most drawn to. So I knew immediately that I wanted to write uh, the same kinds of books that I found most engaging as a kid. And most of those books were fantasy. Mm-hmm. So you decided to follow the same line. Do you have a favorite author, fantasy author? It's hard to pick one favorite. My <laughs> biggest inspirations were Cornelia Funka, J.K. Rowling, Rick Riordan. Mm-hmm. I loved, who else? The Artemis Fowl series. That was a big inspiration for me. Mm-hmm. All of those sort of classic middle grade fantasy titles. J.K. Rowling. I think I've heard of her. <laughs> There's a Wizards or something, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I won't ask how old you are. I can when that book came out, I can already guess and it's just going to be depressing. So your first book was Rule for Thieves, right? Mm-hmm. And then the second one was The Shadow Thieves. The Shadow Thief Thieves. Thieves. And are they related to one another? Yes, The Shadow Thieves is a direct sequel. Okay, and then the third one is The third one is called Seekers of the Wild Realm, and it's the first in a new series. So that's a departure. Are we going to get a third book in the first series? We are going to get a second book in the Seekers of the Wild Realm series. Okay, so you're going to focus on that one now. Yes. Tell me what that's about. So it's about a 12-year-old girl who wants to be something that's called a seeker, which in her village is someone who gets to find and care for magical creatures Mm -hmm. and also bring magical artifacts back to the village. Um, But the problem is she's the first girl in her village to ever try to become a seeker. The seekers have always been boys. So she wants to win this magical competition to become a seeker. But when she's not allowed to train with the boys, she instead uh, teams up with one of her biggest rivals and cares for a baby dragon in secret in order to get the knowledge that she needs (laughs) to uh, compete to become a seeker. Sounds like a timely story. I like that a lot. As I said in the introduction, you also do a lot of editing. You used to work with Enchanted, and now you're doing it on your own. And if people want to find out more about that, visit your website? That's right, alexandraott.com. So what editing do you do, or what do you find that's most useful to the people that you work with? I always recommend that uh, writers start with a developmental edit so that we can focus on the big picture structure of the Mm -hmm. story, all of the biggest elements, the plot progression, the characterization, the world building. We really start from there. But then I also offer copy editing to look at the line by line edits and grammar and sentence structure and syntax and all of those elements. When's the right time for a developmental edit, though? Should someone be contacting you before they start the book? or when they're halfway through the first dra- draft? or What do you think works best? My recommendation is actually to do a revision on your own first after mm-hmm. you've written the first draft, and then to pursue editing once you know that you have made the changes that, that you can make and made the book the best that you feel you can on your own right. and are then ready to get some additional feedback and some additional suggestions for how to improve the craft. So that's probably after several drafts of the manuscript, I would think, right? Yeah, I recommend at least one revision. More is better. I think the more polished that you can get the manuscript on your own, then the more beneficial you will find editing Mm -hmm. because then you're getting feedback on things that you wouldn't have known to correct yourself. But not when they're so far down the line and have worked on it so long, they resist change <laughs> or outside input. It'd be too far in the process that you're not willing to make any big picture changes. A developmental edit is definitely a structural revision. So you should be prepared to make those really large changes to any of the elements of the book. But I think it's helpful to pursue that developmental edit when you know that you have 
made the structural changes that you can on your own and you're ready to get um, that additional level of feedback. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you've written several books. You've edited probably many more. What are the most common problems or mistakes? You can have more than one, (laughs) but what are the most common things that that cropping up in manuscripts you work on? Yeah, there are a lot of big ones. I would say one of the most common is not focusing on character goals. Mm. Having a main character who doesn't have a specific goal in mind or something that they need, not knowing what they want. And so then the story often doesn't progress very clearly. It doesn't have any forward momentum because the character isn't clearly pursuing something. Mm -hmm. Similarly, I see a lot of issues with character agency with characters who are just reacting to the things that happen around them or they're just reacting to things that other characters do and they're not making active decisions to pursue their own goals and to make things happen in the story. That makes sense. So what's your day look like? You get up in the morning and start working on your book or editing or do you do the editing between books or how do you make it all fit together? Varies a little depending on deadlines. Right. right now I have a deadline for a revision of my next book. Most of my days are focused on trying to revise and meet that deadline. Sure. But on an average day, I typically start with editing in the morning. A lot of the just emails, setting up projects, sort of administrative work happens in the morning. A lot of editing in the afternoon and then writing at night. Okay. What about just general writing advice? I usually launch these interviews by asking If you could give an aspiring writer one piece of advice, what would it be? But I didn't think of that this time, so I'm just (laughs) going to wedge it into the middle. If you could give an author one piece of advice, what would that be? Oh, I think the most useful thing that a a writer ever said to me Mm -hmm. was to cultivate perseverance and patience. I am not very good at being patient. (laughs) As a young writer, I had this novel and I really wanted to pursue everything right now, really wanted to be be published as soon as possible. And it was really a process of learning how to continue persevering in my craft, even knowing that a lot of my goals were a a long ways away. Sure. And that I had to be, you know, both both patient in trying to achieve those goals, but also uh, really persevering and going after what I wanted. Well, that is the hardest thing about writing much less a writing career. I'm used to, here's this thing I've got to do. I'm going to sit down and do it and I'm not going to get up until it's Mm -hmm. done, but you can't write a book that way. (laughs) It's going to take many moons, no matter how consistent you are. So you've got to be paid and then building a career. That's even harder. That takes even longer. And yet here you seem to have done it. Where do you see yourself on down the road, five years or even 10 years down the road? Where would you like to be? It's hard to predict anything, but what I'm working on right now, I want to cons- I want to continue doing uh, middle grade fantasy novels and building my readership there. But I am also looking into developing a few more young adult ideas. Sure, I have some fantasy novels that I like to work on there as well. So yeah, just continuing to put more books out, continuing to edit. Let's talk more about those books because I think you're at least somewhat unique in that you've written both middle grade and young adult. Can you explain you know, in the nutshell form, what's the difference? What are the different concerns for writing each of these for different age groups? Yeah, there are several, but to, to sum it up quickly. Oh, you don't have to be that <laughs> quick. But <laughs> Yeah. So middle grade is typically aimed at younger readers. Upper middle grade, like my books, tend to be readers ages 8 to 12, mm-hmm. uh, whereas uh, young adult books are uh, teenagers. So a lot of the big differences are just in um, making the books engaging for those audiences. So a middle grade novel is going to have typically an 11 or 12 year old protagonist. They're going to be really focused on the issues that are relevant for kids at that age. It's going to have a voice that sounds more like an 11 or 12 year old. They also tend to have a lot more focus on humor. They tend to have really fast pacing. Typically, you you see a lot of sort of adventure stories as well as modern contemporary stories. Uh, Young adult is obviously more geared toward teenagers, so it's going to be a little bit more specific in genre. It's going to have uh, protagonists who are typically 16, 17, 18. Uh, You'll see a little bit more maturity of content, typically some darker tones, uh, less emphasis on humor, but still a lot of humor in them as Mm -hmm. well. They maintain a fast pacing too. It's really about making sure that it's engaging for uh, the specific age of the reader. Every book wants to be engaging. Right. Every writer wants to be, but... What's engaging to a sixth grader may be different from what's in, 
uh, engaging to an 11th grader, right? Exactly. Probably less underpants jokes and more about right. dating or something like that. And now, of course, you hear people talking about new adult supposedly for even older than the young adult college and on. Is that a real thing or is that just something people talk about? New adult was a thing. I don't <laughs> think it's as much of a thing right now. Was it ever? What would be a good example um, of a new adult book? Yeah. So for a while there was, there were a lot of titles actually that were considered new adult. They were mm -hmm. primarily uh, romance and mm. focused on romance and they were more college-age protagonists or protagonists uh, in their early 20s. There were several imprints that did publish new adult titles. When I worked at Entangled, we had a few new adult imprints. However, that, that category has mostly blended into either young adult or adult now. Mm. The more sort of, the titles that are considered a little bit too uh, mature for young adult are now just being marketed primarily as adult titles. Right. Uh, it wasn't a marketing category that was ultimately as successful as I think some publishers were hoping that it would be. Right. right. Trying to hold on to the Harry Potter crowd, even as they <laughs> aged out. But if they just read adult books, I think that's that works just as well, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Alexandra, this has been a total delight. Thank you for coming to WriterCon and thank you for being on this podcast. Thank you so much for having me. All right, that wraps it up for this podcast. And if you're sitting at home thinking, man, I wish I'd gone to WriterCon this year. And, you know, who wouldn't be? Because <laughs> we're having so much fun here. I promise you there will be a WriterCon 2021. And as soon as I have the details on that, I will let you know. But it will be Labor Day weekend in Oklahoma City next year. Until then, keep writing. And remember, you cannot fail if you refuse to quit. Everyone. Yeah.